Draw your church together, O God. Uniting all your children in heart, mind, and spirit. Draw your church together, O God. Into a company of disciples following your beloved Son, Jesus. Draw your church together, O God. Serving others in the spirit of Jesus who came to serve. Draw your church together, O God. Creating a place where mercy and grace, acceptance and compassion are gifts offered and received. Draw your church together, O God. And may we be known by our love for one another. Our first lesson of the day comes from the book of Romans, chapter 17 verses 15 through 25a. I do not understand my own actions, for I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. Now, if I do what I do not want, I agree that the law is good. But in fact, it is no longer I that do it, but sin that dwells within me. For I know that nothing good dwells within me that is in my flesh, I can will what is right, but I cannot do it. For I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I do. Now if I do what I do not want, it is no longer I that do it, but sin that dwells within me. So I find it to be a law that when I want to do what is good, evil lies close at hand. For I delight in the law of God in my inmost self, but I see in my members another law at war with the law of my mind, making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. Wretched man that I am, who will rescue me from this body of death? Thanks be to God, through Jesus Christ our Lord. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray together. Give us, O oh Lord, we pray, a firm faith, an unwavering hope, a vibrant joy, a perfect love. Pour into our hearts, Lord, the spirit of understanding and wisdom the spirit of counsel and knowledge, the spirit of a holy fear that humbles one in your presence. Light eternal, shine into our hearts. Power eternal, deliver us from evil. Wisdom eternal, scatter the darkness of our ignorance. Love eternal, Gaze upon us with mercy and compassion in your eyes. O Lord, grant that we may always seek your face, pursue your kingdom, love you with heart and mind, soul and strength, and love our neighbors as we love ourselves. Amen.
Let us turn now to Paul's first letter to Timothy, chapter 1. We we'll begin reading with verse 12. I am grateful to Christ Jesus our Lord, who has strengthened me, because he judged me faithful and appointed me to his service. Even though I was formerly a blasphemer, a persecutor, and a man of violence. But I received mercy because I had acted ignorantly in unbelief, and the grace of our Lord overflowed for me with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. The saying is sure and worthy of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the foremost. But for that very reason, I have received mercy, so that in me, as the foremost, Christ Jesus might display the utmost patience, making me an example to those who had come to believe in him for eternal life. To the king of the ages, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Many Christians have a very intense reaction to the Apostle Paul. There are Christians who are absolutely enamored with Paul. He is their super apostle. They admire his passion for the gospel of Jesus Christ and his forceful defense of the gospel to the Gentiles. For them, his writings are the essential core of the New Testament. Sometimes these Christians appear so devoted to the Apostle Paul that you begin to wonder if they are devoted to Paul or to Jesus. Now on the other side, there are Christians just as devoted in their suspicion of the Apostle Paul. They are surprised by what appears to be his arrogance. They become uncomfortable when Paul says, imitate me. If they are Christian women, they often resist instinctively the second class status Paul appears to grant women. When Jesus was so open to women. Paul tells women to be quiet in church, while women were the first to see the risen Christ. At times, Paul seems not to know what to do or how to deal with women at all. Jesus spoke to women. Jesus allowed women to touch him. Jesus allowed women to follow him, taking care of his needs out of their own resources. Other Christians resist devotees of Paul who seem to believe that what Paul says is more important than what Mark and Matthew, Luke and John and James have to say about following Jesus. Some Christians react because Paul appears to be primarily concerned about salvation while Jesus was primarily concerned about the kingdom of God. Rarely do you find people sitting in the middle with Paul. You may love him, you may fight with him, or you may choose to try and ignore him. Now this morning, I want to encourage you to look at Paul in a different way. I think there is more to Paul than we have understood in our reactions to him. First, we must be willing to see Paul as a mere human being like ourselves, seeking to be faithful to the best that he has experienced of God in Jesus the Christ. I find that Paul's most devoted adherents and his most severe critics are tempted to rob him of his humanity. And if you want to turn Paul or Jesus or any holy person into an idol, then just strip them of their humanity. But if we choose to see Paul's humanity, I think we'll find a person that we share more in common with than maybe we have ever imagined. 
Here is a man, a follower of Jesus, who openly confesses that he doesn't understand himself and his own actions. He finds that for some reason he is unable to do what he wants to do, and he easily falls into the temptation of doing things he hates and despises. He finds himself powerless to do the good thing he desperately wants to do, and his dark motives seem to always take him hostage. He finds it is a fact that when he wants to do what is good and right, evil tempts him at every turn, and he finds most often that he falls for the temptation. Paul is a very frail frail human being who cannot listen to his teacher, Gamaliel, the influential Jewish teacher of his time, who tells the Jewish leaders to leave the young Christian movement alone. For if that movement is not of God, it will die away. But if it is of God, there will be nothing they can do to stop it. Yet there is Paul holding the jackets of those who stone Stephen and then sets out on his own mission to search and destroy the followers of the way. Here is a man who cannot see that his zeal for his faith has him battling with God he believes he loves and desires to serve. He cannot see what he is actually doing until he is knocked down and blinded. You see, Paul was devoted to his blindness, his stubborn will, his zeal, and his precious beliefs, as devoted as any of us are. Paul will forever express his insecurity about his calling to be an apostle. He is not like Peter and John. He did not walk with Jesus or talk with Jesus. He had a brief encounter with the risen Christ on the Damascus Road. Perhaps it is because he is so insecure in his standing as an apostle that he is constantly tempted to get into a spitting contest with Peter. What is there about Peter that threatens Paul. Paul is an educated man. Peter is a fisherman. Paul grasps quickly the expansive implications of the good news. Peter stumbles around, catching on slowly, learning by his mistakes. Yet Paul wants to let us know that he once had a smackdown with Peter, because Peter was a hypocrite, eating with the Gentiles until the folks from Jerusalem arrived, and then he went to eat in the kosher dining room. You see, it seems to me that we could see a lot of ourselves in Paul if we would only allow him to be human like ourselves. We struggle with doing the right things, We are haunted by our regrets. We have done mean and petty things. There are dark things we have done that we hide in secrecy and silence. We are convinced that we have done some things that are so bad that even Jesus couldn't forgive us and love us. Now, that is truly a sin of pride. Like Paul, some of us are frightfully insecure. We don't know who we are. We keep looking for someone to tell us that we are okay. We keep trying to prove ourselves worthy of the attention of others. So, I think we share many things in common with the very human Apostle Paul. This morning, I believe there is something we need to learn from him. Something that has escaped 
us for far too long and escaped far too many of us. Now, in all the wonderful things Paul could recite about his life, here is the perspective from which he chooses to understand what has happened to him as he was transformed by the love and power of God. Paul writes, I was formerly a blasphemer, a persecutor, a man of violence. For some reason, Paul drives his stake in the ground. From this point, the point of his greatest sense of guilt and shame, he will begin to describe the transformation he experienced. What happened to Paul may happen to you and me if we put our stake in the ground in the right place. Paul received the mercy of God. He had acted in ignorance, for he did not understand the ways of God. More precisely, He did not understand the new ways of God revealed in the cross of Jesus. He was controlled by false ideas that he refused to surrender, to give up. He refused the new wine, and his old wineskin had to be shattered. Yet despite all of this, blasphemer, persecutor, man of violence, man of ignorance the grace of God overflowed to him. When Paul's sin was great, God's grace was greater. Paul received the gift of faith. Somehow he managed to accept that God, God had graciously accepted him, a blasphemer, a persecutor, a man of violence and ignorance, who had once arrogantly proclaimed his perfection, and all matters of the law of God. Paul finally accepted that God had new ways. Grace trumps law. Mercy trumps judgment. Forgiveness trumps condemnation. Love is supreme. He accepted these things not because he finally got them into his head, but because he experienced them through the power of faith. Paul received the gift of love as revealed in the cross of Christ Jesus. Paul finally understands that God loves sinners. Paul finally accepts that God is for sinners on their side. Paul finally embraces that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Paul will accept being the greatest of all sinners because he experienced mercy in God's patience. And he learned the depths of God's love for sinners firsthand from a very personal experience. I know we don't like to talk about sin. We get all hung up on it. But I want to refocus, if I can, how we see sin this morning. I want to say to you that our greatest sin may be our devotion to a misguided belief that we are somehow unlovable. And because we are or we see ourselves as unlovable, we have rejected our very selves. Because we have rejected ourselves, We find it so challenging to accept these statements. God loves sinners. Jesus came to save sinners. We are sinners loved and accepted by God. If we cannot accept this love of God, we are terribly handicapped in our ability to love ourselves and others. I sense that most of us are wounded at some deep level. We are fixated on how unworthy we are to be accepted not only by God, but by almost anyone. We cannot compliment anyone because 
we cannot accept the compliment. We cannot graciously receive a gift offered us because we feel that we're somehow obligated once we receive the gift. We cannot see others as okay because we don't feel okay about ourselves. We are confirmed critics because we are hard on ourselves. We cannot love freely because we won't allow anyone to love us. The healing of our bodies and our souls, the restoration of our spirits, the renewal of joy in our living will come only when we finally realize and accept that God loves us. God loved us long before we ever gave any thought about God, any thought of loving Him. Now I'm going to wager that both Paul's most devoted admirers and most passionate critics have yet to come to this realization. God loves sinners. Jesus came to save sinners. This is the good news. This is the gospel. God loves us all. Yet we have spent so much time identifying sins and condemning sinners, judging sinners and condemning sinners, shaming people for who they are. We are so dominated by sin and thus by guilt and shame that we barely can live. Do we wonder why at this time no one really wants to listen to what Christians have to say when we're so obsessed with sin? We are tempted to talk compulsively about sin and are strangely silent about forgiveness. We pour on the guilt and shame and are silent about mercy and grace. It is time, long overdue, for those of us who believe that God is love, for we have experienced ourselves this power of love to transform us as it did for Paul. Paul the blasphemer, Paul the persecutor, Paul the man of violence, Paul the man of ignorance. It is now time for us to go public and to declare with passion, there is mercy, grace, and love for sinners like Paul and sinners like us all. Yes, whoever we are, whatever guilt and shame we carry, no matter how worthless or unworthy we think we are, God loves sinners. Jesus came to save sinners. God loves sinners like Paul and like you and like me, and Jesus saves sinners like Paul, like you, like me. This is the good news. God loves sinners. Amen. As we go into the coming week, may we carry this blessing with us. Live simply, love generously, speak truthfully, serve faithfully, leave everything else to God, go in peace.